Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Classroom 2 Live today. It's uh, Saturday, the 29th of September, 2012. Our topic today is inquiry, learning, and empowering students, and our special guest today is David Trush. Hi. Nice to see you here, David. Before we get David working, uh, we make you work a little bit, so I just want to uh, draw your attention to a few things. That during the session, we have a live binder uh, created for you, which is a c collection of all the references, websites, etc., that David will be sharing during the session. Just so that you know that if it goes by in the chat and you've missed it, you can go to the live binder uh, after the show. And as you see, Peggy and Kim are dropping in the link to the to live binder. It's uh, just a terrific way to be able to review, and, and if somebody wants to open it right now, then you can follow along as uh, David goes through the presentation. For those of you who are new, you may not know that we do keep a recording of almost everything on our website at liveclassroom20.com, and specifically on the archives and resources page, and you're going to find it great because all our shows are there, and today's session will be recorded with a full Blackboard Collaborate recording. You'll find that in our blog post. You'll also find an MP3 file, an audio file. You'll find an embedded MP4 file, which is a recording of what's going on today in a different format and because it is uh, embeddable that if you needed to share it with someone you could take it and do that. Um, as well, the chat log, uh, again if you miss anything, any of those links, they're also posted in the chat log, log which we post on our website as well. So I talked to a few of you a minute ago we, as we started a pre-show session about using the, the laser pointer which is the second icon down in your whiteboard tools. I need you to click on that and locate yourself in the world. I'm in St. Catharines, Ontario, and I know that Dave is in Port, Qu Port Coquitlam in British Columbia. Again, two of us are Canadians this morning, as well as Phoenix, Arizona is the hometown for Peggy George, and uh, Kim Case is in San Antonio, Texas. So let's give a, a, a quick look about where we are located in the world. Most of Canada, United States today. Oh, Thailand is shambles here somewhere. I didn't see his name in the chat, but welcome everyone. It's great to have you today, and it is kind of fun to look at the world map. So now that you've mastered that tool, we're going to get you to do some voting on our poll question today. And we use those questions to help our presenter get a sense of uh, what the audience doesn't does and doesn't know, so we can help uh, frame the presentation. So our first question today, really quickly, is have you used project-based learning in your classroom? Green check if you have, red X if you haven't. And I see the votes coming in. If you don't know how to use that polling option, then please just type it in the chat as well. So if you are using project-based learning, green check if you're not, red X. Just going to publish the responses. I think most people have had a chance to vote. Well, a few people haven't been able to figure out the polling, but some people are still coming in. But there you go, David. Uh, as we can see right now, half of our participants are using pro project based learning. Our second question today is Do you or your students use mobile devices for recording voice to share work or feedback? Do you use do you or your students use mobile devices for recording voice to share work or feedback? Green check if it's yes, red X if it's a no. That's pretty logical. Most of you have had a chance to vote. I'm just going to publish that to the chat. And only about a third are actually doing this. So we have a different. Uh, results for this question. Our next poll question is number three. Do you use people from your community or your personal learning network to share authentic learning experiences with your students? It's a long question, but it's a yes and no again. Do you use people from your community or PLN to share authentic learning experience with your students? I'm 
going to go ahead and publish the results. Mm, about half. It's terrific news to hear that we're using that kind of experience for our students. So that's a good um, overview, David, for who uh, your audience is today. And I know we have several people who are just coming in, so they might not have had a chance to uh, review the questions. And before I get into introducing uh, David, I still always want to uh, draw attention to two great people who are assisting us today, besides Kate. Peggy and Kim, we have Tammy Moore in the chat who's providing closed captioning, and Lori Moffat, who is our backup um, moderator from once we uh, are not able to attend, and she's just as faithful. I think we all enjoy the experience of being here today, so thank you very much, Lori and Tammy, with helping out again today. Uh, so it's my pleasure at this point then to introduce to you our guest, David Trust, and our topic again is Inquiry Learning and Empowering Students. Uh, David is uh, married to a teacher, who was kind of a great experience, and has two daughters that are 10 and 12, and I'm sure that uh, uh, frames everything you do, David. He and his family are recently spent two years living in China, where he was the principal of an international school. Currently, he's thrilled to be involved with the Inquiry Hub, which I hope uh, David's going to take a second and explain to us what Inquiry Hub is. And where he goes back to the classroom, he's pretty excited about that. He's digital, teaching digital literacy and covering for teacher preps one day a week. David is, as he said, he's a self-professed edu nerd, and I know because I've met him face to face, which is a great experience. And he admits to spending spare time reading blog posts, tweeting, and learning rather than watching television or sports. He blogs primarily at Paradigms for your thoughts, but it was also uh, blogs on connected principles, and a not-so-daily blog he calls the Daily Inc. And next on his list is to start podcasting. So that's a pretty good start. Even if you can take a second, uh, David, to talk about Inquiry Hub, that would be terrific because we have that link on our page. But I'm going to turn the microphone over to you, and with the great sincerest thanks for being with us today to share your expertise, which I know is quite large. Good morning, David. Good morning. Thanks for that lovely introduction. Um, yes, I, uh, I'm a bit of an edgy nerd and I have a lot of fun with it, but uh, having met you, I know that although you have many, many hats, Lorna, you, um, you certainly are a passionate educator as well. And it's wonderful to be able to speak to Peggy and Kim and everybody in here. I hope, uh, I, hope I hear more voices than just mine today. Uh, last year, um, my my vice principal and I, we work at Coquitlam Open Learning. My principal and I, I'm the vice principal, sorry. Um, we work in different buildings. And he picked me up one day uh, and said, uh, we're going for lunch. And he, uh, he took me out and said, so I pitched a new school to our superintendent. And he said, yes. <laughs> so I, I was just giddy when I heard this. And it's just fantastic. Uh, I'll introduce you to my principal, my superintendent, a little later in, in the slideshow. But basically, um, uh, the the idea was that we would leverage the resources we have at, at Coquitlam Open Learning with online courses uh, that are available to be able to open a very small school uh, where we would just look at things quite differently. And basically, we took away the entire block schedule. Uh, and instead of having block scheduled teachers in the mornings have sort of seminars where they uh, and workshops where they talk to the students that are related to the topics they're talking to, um, and the rest of the morning is used for sort of doing uh, work related to their online courses. But the more exciting pieces of the afternoons are based around inquiry questions that they develop for themselves. The idea is that as they develop those inquiry questions, the teachers at the school will say, well, since you're studying this, we can take this part of your online course out of the curriculum because you're going to cover it in your inquiry. And our goal is for ultimately for them to take as much of the actual curriculum and do it through self-discovery and questions, um, inquiry questions that they develop and find answers to. And so that's uh, sort of the inquiry hub in a nutshell. We're starting with just um, just a, over 30 students, and it's been a great start so far. So of course my dog starts to bark right in the middle of this, so everyone enjoy that for a second. I'm going to shut off, because what you were leading into is this newbie question, what is inquiry learning? Well, 
to me, inquiry learning is a, it's actually a form of active learning. So uh, it's much more student driven. It's where students are provided an opportunity to explore and question on their own, and also with the facilitation of a teacher. To me, it's about formulating good questions and then coming out with thoughtful, rich, and also compelling answers. Thank you. We've calmed down at this end of the world. This is your opportunity. To thank you very much for uh, coalescing your ideas here. Can you uh, now take the controls? And you have the slides, and you're you're on you're on the hook now. Way to go, David. Great. Thanks. So I thought I would share uh, just some contact information with, my, with me first off. But uh, really, what I want to do is just kind of get going. Um, and what I want to do first off is talk about the idea of a, uh, you know, when I talk about trans transforming your classroom, I think there's a real um, <coughs> transformation going on, and it's a really exciting time to be an educator. It's just, it's just fabulous. Uh, it's one of those things where, um, for me, I, I got reinvigorated as a teacher when I started to look at um, empowering my own students and getting excited about what they were able to achieve when uh, I, I let sort of let go the reins. And so um, I think that I would like to start the presentation with actually a question of my own. And to me, this is, this is the essence of what I'm trying to, to say here. And so how will you transform your classroom into an inquiry-driven, collaborative, and engaging learning environment? And so to me, it didn't make sense that I would be talking about inquiry and not sort of design the entire presentation around questions. So I'll be asking a few questions along the way that hopefully inspire you at some point. One of the things that I think is important is the idea that uh, the internet is not a faster way of finding information. And I love the idea of that we're playing a new game, not the old game, uh, but faster. And when I go back to that question that I posed earlier, the, the key word, I think, is how will you transform? This is not just about tweaking and doing things slightly better, but it's actually about really changing the way we do things. And a perfect example of that is, this actually happened. Um, I can remember those days when I used to have to sit and trace a map out of a um, out of an atlas. You can give me a little check mark if that's something you had to do as a kid, and let me know if that's something that uh, you experienced. Um, this to me was a, a rather scary thing to see a student now using the computer in the same way I use the atlas and using it to to trace the shapes of letters. Um, and that's where I talk about uh, transformation. We had blackboards. We switched to green boards. Then they became white boards. And now we have smart boards. But if that smart board is just to transfer information, then it's really not a transformative tool at all. And uh, the post that I linked to here, that's actually the post where that inspired um, this presentation. This is my superintendent of schools, Tom Grant. And uh, I interviewed him for a presentation. And I'm sharing parts of my Classroom 2.0, uh, um, not Classroom 2.0, um, K-12 online conference slides in this presentation. Um, and he really sort of nails the idea here that technology is about supporting effective pedagogy. Um, and so I think that's one of the key things to, to think about is it's not just about using the tools, but how you use it in order to be effective as an educator. That's the most important thing. So I've collected the, the seven ways to transform your classroom on my blog. And without further ado, let's get started. And the first one is inquiry and getting students to actually seek their questions, seek out their own questions, and then explore the answers. And this, to me, is, is sort of the most exciting place uh, to get started. Um, it's one of the key things about learning is, for me, is that when I'm in charge of my own learning, when I'm 
choosing to go and explore new things, that's what I'm most excited about learning. And I think the, the same thing stands true for our students as well. And as we developed the Inquiry Hub, one of the things that I did was I sat down and really started to investigate what is Inquiry all about. I've shared a link here. And I've collected some of the best resources that I could find on Inquiry and shared them in sort of one place. I'm actually linking to the Inquiry Hub's new collaborative blog. This is the first blog post on it. And um, I really hope that if you go to any link today that I share, I really hope that this is the one you go to. Um, and then explore some of the links that are there uh, because there's just amazing things to, to share. So one of my possible Inquiry questions that you could leave here with today is which of these resources will help you develop a more Inquiry-based lesson? Uh, lessons and uh, plans. And as I said before, I think it's the most important thing is, is when the inquiry comes from within, that is when it's really powerful and it's very engaging. And here are a couple of uh, Brian Jackson students that I interviewed and they were talking about um, developing interesting questions and how it engages them. My first real experience with this was a project called um, Science, uh, Science Alive, where I had decided that I was going to let my students choose any topic in science they wanted to explore, as long as they did something with an experiment, um, and then they shared their items on a wiki page. Um, I also did a reflective piece on this. I think it's in the live binder, um, where uh, I shared my reflections after taking, doing this presentation. I, I like to mention this uh, Science Alive because if you go to it, it's far from perfect. Um, it was my first experiment. I'd never tried wikis before. I was about two days ahead of the students. Um, but I learned so much from just putting myself out there and trying it. And it really was something that launched me as someone that understood the value of letting students be excited about their own questions. The second way to transform your classroom is through voice and the idea of um, sharing. <coughs> Excuse me. Just the idea of, of allowing students to, to share um, and giving them that sense of voice. I gave you a um, another question here, uh, which is. How can you use recording devices to get students prepared for presentations um, and to share their work publicly? And I think that it's a really exciting thing now that, um, just like the poll question asked, that you can, so many people come to class with a recording device in their pockets already. And um, I think that there's just amazing ways to share and to allow students to even hear their own voice before you're to, to share it publicly. Um, I remember having to to practice reading my public speech to someone, you know, in my class, and it's just so fundamentally different reading it to someone out loud and then being able to hear yourself again afterwards compared to just getting feedback without knowing what the difference was that they're trying to suggest. Um, but that's a very literal thing. Recording voice is a literal way of sharing vo sharing voice. Uh, when I talk about sharing voice, I'm also talking about actually giving students the power of voice within your, your school um, and within the world. And I think that this is an area where education has already um, had a transformation. We understand the value of giving voice compared to 50 years ago where the student was to sit and to be the uh, receiver of knowledge only. So this is an area I think everybody has sort of improved. Next is audience. And I think I think uh, this, this is an area w that has a, a, a personal piece for me. As a, as a young child, I can always remember my teachers saying, you have to write to an audience. And who is your audience when you're writing this piece? And I went through. Um, High school hearing that, I went through university hearing that, I started to teach and I started to say, who is your audience to, stu to students? And, and here's the thing, 
I didn't get it until I started to blog. It was only after I blogged and I actually had a legitimate audience. That is when I realized that um, audience really matters. <laughs> it really does. And so I started to change my, my writing. I think I've become a far better writer in the last six years of blogging than I ever have, um, despite the fact that I enjoy writing. Uh, it's just amazing how when you give a legitimate audience to people, um, how they're willing to step up. And on that note, I think it's really important um, to think about what you share with an audience. It's so important to help students understand the importance of telling their story. Uh, and so that's something that's, that's sort of the, the first of two points I want to make is, is just the idea that uh, as far as um, uh, audience goes. The first is that we really have to help students understand that if they want an audience, then good writing matters. And that happens uh, naturally in a class when you start blogging with them because the people who are writing compelling things end up getting more comments and so on. And so I think that's an exciting piece of, uh, of audience. The second piece is how powerful it is to share that uh, with the world. Um, really, it shouldn't be that a student writes a brilliant piece of work and the teacher is the only person that sees it. I think we're past that now. And so I love this quote by Chris Lehman. And it really is important that, first of all, that we're trying to do powerful work, but then also that we uh, share it with others. The next idea is community. And uh, this continues on the theme about powerful work. And it's so important that we try to do work that really, really matters. Um, when we get into the community and find out what community needs are, and that helps drive what we do in, in a school, I think that's a very rich thing. Um, and so I would uh, basically like to question uh, you and challenge you to think who it is that you have in your community or online network. And it doesn't have to be an online network. It can be someone in your local community as well. But who is it that you know that can share their expertise with your students. Um, I, I love the quote, the smartest person in the room is the room. And the idea that when we're working together as a community, it's that collective piece that makes us that much smarter. But there's another aspect of that. And that is the idea that um, uh, we can actually pull in experts uh, to, to talk with us. And that expert can be someone you know locally. It can be someone that you just happen to know through Twitter. Um, the thing about it is that community is so, so important. Um, here are two people within two very different communities of mine. Kim Quayer is um, the academic advisor for Coquitlam Open Learning. And every time I have a conversation with her, it's a learning conversation. And we think about um, the different ways that we can engage students and do things differently and improve and challenge each other all the time. Um, so Julie Lindsay is one of the first people I followed online. Her and Vicki Davis created the Flat Classroom Project, where uh, Julie was, I believe, in Qatar, and Vicki Davis was in uh, Georgia, in the US, and they connected their, their students together and wrote about um, Thomas Friedman's The Flat Classroom. And one student from each class halfway around the world were partnered together in order to write about the chapters of this book. Um, one of the neat things about it was they actually got Thomas Friedman to, um, to be one of the judges for their, for the competition between the students for, um, for that project. And it was just amazing. Um, and so it's the idea here that I'm trying to make is, is that we want to build community, but that community can extend outside of our classroom as well. The next, um, the next thing is leadership. And for me, uh, this is a passion of mine, is, is a, a looking at how we can empower students. Um, and one of the neatest things I think about, about empowering students is that they always will surpass your expectations. 
And so uh, I'm going to share a link here. And the question is, how can you create a more authentic leadership, leadership opportunities for your students in, in your class? The link I provided is to my master's paper that I wrote on developing a, a student leadership program. Uh, I, I think that although that was designed for developing uh, for a whole school, uh, there are a lot of things in there that you can do for your individual class as well. And I, I really designed the paper around a, a, an appendix. The appendix is half of the entire uh, paper where I'm just providing resources that you can use to, to help students uh, become leaders in your classroom. And I think one of the most powerful ways that we can empower students to be leaders is to realize that they can be teachers too. Um, think of when we think of our our students as both teachers and co-learners in our in our classrooms. I think that's when um, again they really shine and, and can impress you. And so, just as a quick little recap, we. Um, we, you know, we talked about uh, inquiry, voice, audience, community, and leadership. And just looking at uh, those five, I think it's a pretty amazing um, way to engage and transform your classroom. And when you do that, uh, there's just no telling how far this work will go when, when you start to ripple into your community and start to share around the world. And so. Um, I think that's a, a really good place for me now to, to take a pause. And I guess I'll just go onto this slide here. Um, and let's play a little bit. What I'd like to do is open up the floor and um, see if there's any questions or any comments that people would like to make. If you have a question that you'd like to ask, you can click on the hand and we'll give you the mic, or you can continue to ask questions in the chat and type them in the chat. OK, Sarah. OK, Sarah, you have the mic. Looks like she's running the audio setup wizard. So uh, when she gets ready, we'll um, check back with her. And Peggy asks, will you be talking about how to bring parents on board with inquiry and learning? Because I know when I taught this way with um, uh, a middle school math with sixth graders, we had some pushback from some of the parents uh, with it being a different way of teaching. Well, it's it's interesting with the Inquiry Hub. We had our our first uh, pre-pack meeting, and I think uh, we're a small school, but we're lucky in that we have a very active parent parent involvement. Um, and I have to be honest, we're we're at a point now um, at the Inquiry Hub where you know we're just finished a few weeks in, and it, it's a little bit scary for for the the parents who are saying, well. You know, are they going to actually get all their courses done in time? Um, are our questions the kind of questions we're we're being asked? Um, it, it it can be a challenge. I think one of the the most important things is is to open up and, and share in advance what you're trying to do with with parents. There's there's no right answer, but um, at the same time, I think uh, once once we're we're sort of being more open. Uh, you know, I I did a lesson with with students and the the I went home the next day and, and shared what we did on, on my blog. Um, I mean, I'm not sending my blog link out to to teacher to parents or anything, but uh, I, I think that sort of being open and sharing is is one of the ways that we can help parents understand. Laura, Lorna, do you have any comments on that? Ten, mil ten million. <laughs> I don't give Lorna too much leeway about talking with, with parents, but you are, you know, uh, the critical thing with any relationship with parents is always about communication and whatever ways you can do that. And I think it's, it, your authentic audience is to include them in what you're, whatever you're writing and that they know about it, which I know you're always open to. It, it makes a uh, great partnership with uh, parents in the, in the classroom, the teacher, and the students. Yeah. Uh, 
I, I wasn't there for it, but one of the um, one of the things that uh, my principal Stephen Wiffen did was he actually uh, had a parent session um, and and actually put them through an, an inquiry process with them, and so I know that was helpful for them to, to actually see the process uh, in action. Other questions? Yes, uh, Sarah, you were. Um, let me. Okay, Sarah. Hi. Hi. Can you hear me? Sure can. Okay. Awesome. Um. Uh, so my question is about struggling learners. While I think inquiry provides huge motivation for students, I worry that teachers um, who adopt this inquiry method, especially sort of middle school and um, high school teachers forget perhaps that they are teachers of reading and writing and how do we help those struggling learners and make sure that teachers always see themselves as, as teachers of reading and writing. I just sort of like to hear um, David speak to that if possible. Thanks. You know, you know that's a, a great question. Um, one of the first things that I, I learned as I started to let students um, develop their own questions is that th there's a real struggle as an educator to find that line of how much scaffolding you provide for, pe for students. If you provide tons of scaffolding so that you're basically starting to lay out the entire assignment and taking away their ability to be creative. Um, I, I was speaking to Gord Holden who, who does a lot of immersive stuff and, and 3D online uh, learning. And he said, you know, I don't even like giving criteria anymore to my excelling students because I find the students that those students will do what it takes to meet my criteria, whereas if I leave it wide open, they'll exceed my expectations. On the other side of that um, is the idea that, you know, things are wide open and, and, and kids who struggle have no idea where to start. And I think that's one of the pieces where um, the, the, it, it's a challenge for, for teachers because now as students are going at their different paces and different directions, how do you find, how do you support that struggling te student? And I think the, the key word is, is that you have to think of the scaffolding in advance. And, and the scaffolding can be a series of questions that you provide for them that they answer to help them um, lead somewhere. Um, you know, at the Inquiry Hub uh, yesterday I, I saw uh, you know, one of the students that wasn't really using their time effectively. And uh, I, I just simply went over and said, you know, I'm going to be coming back to you in 20 minutes. What do you think you'll have done at that point? Um, and he told me, and when I came back uh, um, a little while later, I, probably closer to half an hour to be honest, but um, when I came back to him, he was able to show me what he had done. Um, and we could have a discussion on that. Uh, but if we don't provide that scaffolding for the students that, that need it, it, it really can be, inquiry learning can be scary in a place where, where students flounder. That's a good point about the time limit to kind of structure their accountability. And Zara, you have a question? I see that your mic is active, but I'm not hearing you. Maybe she can type the question. So uh, run the audio set at Wizard by going up to the little star version at the top, or type the question in the chat, and then um, we'll answer your question. And let us know when you have uh, run through the audio set at Wizard and we'll come back to you. And are there any other questions that um, you would like to have addressed before we go on? Lori, did you see any questions that I might have missed? David, how do you get around curriculum expectations as one? Okay, well, for, for us, um, we, we are actually starting with the curriculum and all the learning outcomes um, as a starting point. Um, with the Inquiry Hub, 
we, I mean, we have online courses that go through the curriculum, and then what we're trying to do is pull the inquiry out of those. Um, for for uh, you know a, a typical classroom, I think one of the most important things is it, is for, for the teacher to really understand what the the curriculum pieces are that you want to pull out and make those explicit to students. Right, so a lot of times, with, a lot of times when we teach, we teach a, a mystery. We know what, where the lesson's going and what we want it to achieve, but yet we don't always tell the students where we're going and what we want. You know, one of the fundamental um, things that can improve any classroom is simply having um, an outline or or a description of, of what you plan to do or what you intend to learn, um, written on the board or anywhere um, to start your class. Uh, I think that one of the the key things to do is to make those those learning outcomes explicit to students to actually hand them out to to the students so that they know what it is they're trying to achieve and it serves two purposes one the students understanding exactly where they're going and why and number two by putting it out in front of them it it's a place where a teacher can go back to and say you know we're still trying to work on this and you have to show me that you can understand um, you know this specific learning outcome And Zara asks, how would you scale up to a larger group of students? Scale up? Yes. If you're just starting out. Well, I think I think one of the things, um, you know, we we have a mm -hmm. we have a basically right now uh, 33 students. Uh, that's as big as most classes are anyway, um, and. I think you don't really want to scale up much bigger than, than a class. So I, I'm not sure. Maybe that the question needs to be clarified a bit. But I think the, the the sort of connections you have between a teacher and an individual student are so important. Um, so can I get a clarification on the question? I think that's okay, probably thanks. what she meant. Okay. As an individual yeah. teacher versus yeah. an administrator. Yeah. So I, I had I had the full class in front of me yesterday, um, looking at digital um, digital media, and so I had I had the students actually. Um, one of them told me, "You're making us do something creepy." But I had them looking at um, the digital profiles of uh, four of my friends that I asked in advance. I said, "Can can my students?" my students um, look up your profile and, and see what they can dig up. Um, but it was an amazing process for them to A, uh, see some people who had an amazing digital footprint, uh, B, uh, help each other with their search skills to really get uh, and dig in, and uh, C, also think about their own profile and what they, what they would want to have out there. Um, and I had tried to do this. I had a family emergency and was away and tried to do this lesson through uh, uh, online, giving, putting them through the ropes of, uh, of the activity. Um, and they, they sort of struggled with it, and that's why I went back to it today. And it was amazing because those three things I just told you, I explicitly, before I started today, said, this is why I want you to do this. And um, it's just amazing um, how they really dug in and started to, to search um, once they understood what it is I, uh, I wanted them to do and why. And what grade levels and how many students do you have participating in your program? We have uh, uh, three grade eights, one grade 12, and the rest are 9, 10, 11. Uh, the multi-age piece is a piece I didn't mention about the Inquiry Hub that we think is really important. Our idea is, is that they can focus more around topics of interest and passion uh, as opposed to um, how old they are and whether that they fit with someone else at that age. Yes, it's a high school. David, I know you were basing, I think, everyone giving questions. Did you, you had a few more things that you want to go through? Sure, yeah, thanks. And, and I will open up to some questions again. Um, so uh, number six, I guess we could move on with play. Uh, 
when I ri originally wrote these, um, play wasn't part of it, but uh, um, it was literally uh, a comment. I think it was David Warlick, who um, anybody who knows David Warlick, uh, it was quite an honor to have him <laughs> comment on my blog. But he he looked at the six things that I've mentioned, and he added this one, which was uh, he said the you know uh, learners should also have a um, a sandbox where they can experiment and play, and and the idea of play is one that uh, uh, this is an area of inquiry for me. Um, I know I know for a fact that uh, um, that play is important, and having fun when you're learning is important. <clears throat> but there are aspects too now that are coming out out of out of uh, learning through games, which I think I, I still have a lot to learn about. But if you think about it, when you play a video game. Um, and you make a mistake, uh, you don't usually see people say, well, that's it, I'm never doing this again, like they would with a math question. Um, there are intrinsic things built into games to help students not be frustrated. Games are specifically designed to give students enough challenge that they're not bored, but not too much challenge that they get frustrated but still have achievements that are extremely challenging along the way, like beating that next level. You know, uh, you get to the end of a level and you have to beat sort of the master of the level um, and figure out, how, um, and you have to take all the skills you learned along that level in order to, uh, to achieve victory. Uh, I think that there's a lot that we have to learn. There's, uh, there's badges that are being offered now um, and a lot of things around game design that I think we can implement into to teaching. And it's not about teaching, uh, learning has to be uh, a fun and a playground all the time. What it's more about is taking aspects of, of, of gaming and saying, how can we maintain the same level of sort of challenge um, in our teaching that, that we see in, in gaming? And then there are strategies that can be used. And then, you know, and, uh, that, that to me is a, one of those shifts and transformations where uh, what we're looking at now is learning being far more participatory and uh, not just about uh, content, but what people are able to to do. And, and so it's that active engagement of, of learning that I think is, is really, really exciting. And then finally, that relates uh, right into the idea of networks. And the <coughs> excuse me the the idea of connectivism it's the, the newest learning theory. I don't think there's been a new learning theory for quite a number of years. Uh, but George Seaman and Stephen Downs have uh, uh, been key in, in the idea of connectivism. And uh, to me, connectivism makes a lot of sense because our brain is a neural network. And I think our, our brain fundamentally understands networks um, as a result of itself being a network. And networks are so much richer than just a group. It's amazing when, when you get a network of people together. You know, when I look at my personal learning network, I'm able to ask my, my network questions that, and find answers faster than Google uh, when it's a rich question. Um, and so, I think that it's it's amazing that we um, are live in a time when we have access to so many different networks, and so uh, a, a challenge to you is to say, well, what kind of tools can you use uh, to connect to both other physical and digital networks uh, and learning spaces? Now, a perfect example of a tool that that you can do this with is to start off is Skype. So. That's a, that's a fantastic tool where just to connect to a classroom around the world and to have common questions that you're working on, it's amazing. But we have to go beyond Skype. Skype's a great starting point, and then from there it's like, how do we really connect the learning? Um, and that's something that really, really excites me. So those are the, the seven uh, areas that I suggest. Um, I think one of the most important things to think about now um, well, I'm actually going ahead of myself, sorry. I thought I was coming to a different sl slide. Um, but uh, yeah, so Brian Kuhn here it talks about the importance of, of connecting to others um, and how it drives sort of ingenuity and prosperity. 
And um, Cheryl Oaks talks about how these connections invigorate people. And I think that, uh, uh, you know, I, I've known Lorna for years, and it's great that we met face-to-face. -face. It made the connection that much richer, and those those face-to-face -face connections are really important. But I, I've had amazing opportunities to learn from people around the world that I have yet to meet face-to-face. And uh, my, my my new concept of what it means to, to truly connect and be friends with someone has, has changed over the years. So this is where I thought we were going. Um, where do I start? Where, where, that's, that's one of the, the key questions that I think um, when people look at, um, people need to think about. Um, and this goes back to the scaffolding. Uh, if you look at these seven different things and say, well, you know, I'm going to try and improve in every area of this right off the bat, that, that's overwhelming. It, it lacks that scaffolding to, to do something really, really meaningful um, to, to try to spread yourself out so much. So I think the most important thing to think about when you say, where do I start, um, is the idea that looking at these areas, um, we, sorry, we, um, we need to be models. We need to be people who are trying to do these things for ourselves and not just our classroom. And the idea that we can, uh, uh, in our practice, and in our reflection, we can improve, but it's us actually modeling what we want others to see that is really powerful. And the, that leads to the idea that you know th th there's a it's a there's a default. Um, you can't you can't be a teacher and not be a leader. It's it's not possible. So you are by default a leader um, because you're an educator. And as a leader, the values that you instill in your in your students um, become the reality of your classroom, and that's a really powerful thing to think about. And so, it, you know, basically, what I'm saying is, it starts with you. And when I say starts, it's it's, it's sort of a false pretense uh, because you'll see I changed the wording of of my original question: How will you transform your classroom into an inquiry-driven, collaborative, and engaging learning environment? I actually change it to say, how will you continue to transform? And uh, the reason um, I'm, I'm making that switch um, is because I think that everybody here uh, wants their, child, their students to be in, inquisitive and provide them with a voice, want them to have a legitimate audience, inspire them to be leaders. Um, we, we're already doing these things. It's just a matter now of, of saying, OK, um, I'm going to I, I'm, I'm going to not just talk about these things, but I'm actually going to uh, engage. And th that's one of the most important things. Um, well, you know, I, I've been in a, a network for six years now uh, online that we've been talking about engaging in different things. And I'm blown away by the amount of teachers that I'm now seeing that are just taking the plunge and trying new things in their classroom and then openly sharing it with us. Um, and so that's that's the key thing, as Alice Barr says. You know, it's a positive culture is so important, and the idea of us being flexible and trying new things is just it's just an essential um, part of uh, being an educator. And so, to the question of where do I start, um, I think that that's one of the key things that we need to to say. We can't do everything, and so. Basically, just pick one, and that's that. That's what what my challenge is is to you today. Um, you know, you sat. Many of you have sat and listened to me for an hour, and so uh, thank you very much. Um, and now the, the the challenge is to just pick one of these areas where you say, you know, I really want to improve this aspect of my classroom, and then to make sure that it's not a scary thing when you pick that one. I think it's so important that we we model the idea of community, and it's, uh, we have an opportunity now to um, connect in ways that we never have before. Um, if you have a question for me beyond this uh, th this talk today, then you're free to uh, contact me. I'm happy to help you. I know that our hosts. Uh, 
um, Kim, Peggy, and Lorna, you can ask them questions and, and they will be happy to help engage. Anyone in the Classroom 2.0, uh, Ning, I know would be happy to help you as well. Uh, the idea is that we don't have, uh, despite the fact that we're picking one and going forward, we don't have to do it alone. And that brings me to the conclusion where, uh, you know, here's the strategy, here's the, the scaffolding is the idea of, of using your community and taking advantage of them. Seek community, do something transformative, and then make sure you share what you learn so others can learn too. This is sort of cut, this slide comes from the motto of uh, my principal Stephen Witham who, when we started talking about the Inquiry Hub, he came up with the little motto or tagline, connect, create, and learn. And so if you think of it, um, oops, I didn't mean to jump ahead. If you think of it, uh, seeking community, that's about, um, that, that's the idea of connecting with others to help you. Do something creative, that's about uh, um, creating the idea of, of actually not just talking about but doing something and, and showing a product for what you've done. And then sharing what you learn is, you know, an intricate part of, of sharing is, is that idea that sh uh, sharing, uh, sorry, learning is learning is a, a social thing and that we should really share what we learn both as teachers and uh, as students. And so how will you continue to transform your classroom into an inquiry-driven, collaborative, and engaging environment? That brings us to the end of my talk. I hope there's more questions and I just want to say thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much, David. And that's so important to remember that we need to start small. Uh, start wherever you're at and grow and remember to share your ideas with your community and your connections and help them grow where they are and help become a leader on, on your campus, your district, or wherever you're at. And let's give David a big applause for uh, his presentation today, and thank you so much. Uh, do we have uh, we have a few minutes, like two minutes, for questions? Um, and if David, if you could put your email address in the the chat so that people could contact you. Um, Lori, did I miss any questions that came up? I did capture two, Kim. Uh, okay. The first one was, I, I think it was already answered, but I'll ask it just in case it wasn't, how do you, quote, get around, unquote, curriculum expectations? I think the trick isn't to get around it, it's the thing, the trick is to engage with that curriculum in really meaningful ways. Um, you know, uh, very often, uh, here's a perfect example. Um, I'm a big fan of, of making sure that, you know, reading and writing go across the curriculum. But if you have a student that struggles with, with writing, there's no reason why they need to write you an essay in science. They can demonstrate that learning, uh, the learning outcome in science through a video or through many other means. They don't have to do it through writing if writing is where they struggle. When it gets to English, even if they struggle with writing, you have learning outcomes that say that they have to be able to, you know, write a, a, a paragraph and do different things. And it's important that you hold students to it and hold them accountable. Uh, it's not about avoiding curriculum. It's about being creative. Uh, um, there, there's a, a quote I love that says, you know, we're not supposed to cover the curriculum. We're supposed to uncover the curriculum. And so one of the things that we really want to make sure is that we are exploring and not being stuck to the idea that they have to show this learning in this specific way at this specific time, but that we open that up and be creative about how we meet those curriculum expectations. Thank you. And the other one that I captured was, uh, seems so easy for students to lose focus on long-term projects, which are certainly valuable. Tips for keeping them on track. Um, one of the key things is uh, the scaffolding piece, uh, making sure that you have things along the way, small incremental steps where they can find success. That's what games do as well, right? Games don't just say you have to get to the very end. They give you levels of, uh, and checkpoints along the way. Um, as students start to share um, things online, 
it, that becomes a really neat way to, to do it because it becomes they, their learning becomes transparent. And you know, there are a couple times on the the wiki spaces where um, th where I did the science alive, where uh, you know two students were working on a project, and I remember once pulling them in and saying, uh, you, "The wikis have a history." So I went to the history and I saw one student was the only one that was actually updating the wiki. So even though it looked like work was being done. It, it was actually being done by one student, and I called them on it, and I called them, and I showed them the history, and they sat down with me, and they said, "Look, I uh, I go to my friend's house and look at the time that we made this change, this change, this change, and this change over a series of days, and sure enough, it was all after-school stuff where they were sitting down together and working together, but that sort of granular looking at what they did made them realize I was paying attention and that I actually um, had an expectation that they were both contributing. And so that idea of holding them accountable to the things that they share, uh, I think, is a big piece. Um, I hope that answered the question. Thank you. Those are the two that I found. Thanks, Laurie. And the last question, um, how formal is your assessment, David? How formal? Um, we're yeah, still working cool. on this. One. Yeah, we're, we're we're still working on uh, on our assessment practices. Uh, um, when when you say how formal, um, e each of our teachers have have sort of uh, we have two te two primary teachers, but um, uh, the in the in Canada versus the the United States are very lucky in that we have very few sort of provincial exams or standardized tests that are, that are mandatory. There are very few subjects. Um, but we still are accountable in those subjects. For instance, Social Studies 10 has a provincial exam. And uh, so our students have to make, we have to make sure our students uh, are ready for that exam. But I, I have to admit, I'm so happy to be a Canadian because I understand the frustration of um, those standardized tests and how how hard they can be. One thing I've I've learned is that um, as you start to really work with inquiry learning around specific topics, uh, and it's okay that the topics are teacher driven, especially in a place where standardization may be really high. But as you do that, that idea of students exploring um, the topic, it, it can really be the point where they get well beyond. You know, they really do truly uncovered the curriculum beyond what's expected on a test. I have a, a neat graphic that I uh, um, I did a while back on my blog. I'm going to have to leave you for a second to look at it. And and it's not uh, it's not just me um, saying this. I truly believe that this is the case. Standards and centers of testing. Here we go. Oops. My mouse isn't cooperating with me. Let me get this link. Here we go. I don't know if we can get this image inside of inside of the um, on the screen. Is that possible, Kim? Um, if you post just the link, we can put that in our live binder. Yeah, I just did. Okay. Super. And so, we'll include that as well. Yeah, I, I think that's a final piece that, that I would like to, to leave because I know how standardization can be an issue. And I, I, mm -hmm. I honestly believe that, you know, um, what a standardized test c is covers compared to uh, what the curriculum is um, are both small in comparison to what we're able to, to worry about if we let go of the idea of having to, to teach to the test. So I, I don't know that I have a solution for someone who lives in a very um, standardized um, world, but uh, um, I hope the work of um, people like Will Richardson sending messages out like Why School, uh, a great book mm -hmm. that I'm reading right now, I think that the, that um, those kind of messages are hopefully going to move um, education in the in, in the United States more into the 21st century, like it, it's it's happening in, in in a lot of the parts other parts of the world. 
We've run out of time, but quickly, how did you create this slide? Um, the, oh, the, this slide, the, the thank you slide? Uh-huh. Um, I'm going to have to go and dig up the name of it. There's a website. I actually did have to pay for it. I think it was a dollar or something like that. Okay. Two dollars. But um, there's a website that lets you do that. Uh, let me see if I can dig it up really quickly for you. Okay. You go ahead and do that, and I'm going to go ahead and yeah. formally close out the show. Uh, we want to be mindful of everybody's time. Uh, we are at the top of the hour, and we want to thank everybody uh, for joining us. And we want to let you know that on October 9th, Steve Hargadon will be interviewing Kirsten Olson. And on October 11th, he will be interviewing Blake Bowles. And October 16th, Denise Polk. And October 23rd, Susie Boss. And October 25th, Jamie McMillan. Uh, make sure that you mark your calendars. Those are all at 5 p.m. Pacific and 8 p.m. Eastern, and they are just fantastic interviews. Um, so if you can't attend, make sure you listen to the recordings because uh, they're super fantastic. And our session on October 6th, we'll be having next week our featured teacher, Karen Mensing. And October 13th, the K-12 online conference preview, like we do every year, let you know what's coming up and the conference co-conveners. And then on October 20th, there won't be a show uh, so that everybody can attend the Den Fall virtual conference that the, that's going to be happening that day. And we hope that you will fill out um, if you know a great teacher that you would like to nominate and you think about it during the week, you can fill out the featured teacher nomination form during the week. That's also in the live binder. And um, the link should be posted in the chat as well. So if you think of somebody, please share that with us. Um, somebody who works with teachers or students, just put their name and give us some information about them. And we'd love to have them on a future show. You can also put them in today's survey. As soon as you exit the session today, when you close out, there will be a survey that will automatically open in your browser. You don't need to do anything. It will take care of it for you. And uh, we would love to have your feedback on today's session, as well as some ideas for future topics and future guests, as well. and any time that you watch one of the recordings, you can request a professional development certificate. Just list your name and your email address, and Peggy will get that to you. And you can also list any of the educators that you'd like to see for um, a future uh, featured teacher. We also have an iTunes U channel that you can subscribe to for MP3s and MP4s, and subscribe and keep and take us with you wherever you'd like to go. You can also subscribe via an RSS feed and get all of the links and the chat log, as well as some of the other things that come with it, the live binder link, just by using your RS feed aggregate. We want to extend a very special thanks to David and to Steve Hargadon and to Weebly and to each of you who are faithful or new who are participating in the live session or watching this recording and to Blackboard Collaborate for providing this forum for us to meet and share each and every week. So we want to thank you for joining us. And please join us next week for our next featured teacher session. It will be a fantastic session. You will not want to miss it. Thank you so much. We're going to go ahead and give David an applause uh, for today. It's been great hearing about this fantastic, innovative initiative at his school. We're very grateful that he's taken his time today. 
Thank you so much. Everybody have a great weekend. And we will see you online and see you next week at the same time for our next featured teacher monthly session. Thank you so much. Take care, everybody. Have a great weekend. See you online.